Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode number 236 of the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I'm your coach, Angela Pugh, life coach, recovering alcoholic, and entrepreneur. And today we're going to talk about three ways to build strong sobriety when you don't have family support. And maybe you do have some family support. It just feels like they could be more supportive. And we're going to kind of dig into all these pieces because this can really feel like a lonely journey. But I want you to understand how much power you really have in this situation and the things that you can do to continue to build your sobriety, regardless of what the people around you are doing or not doing. And first things first, there are many reasons that some of us don't have overwhelming family support as we venture into the sober waters. And I think for most of us, our families want to be supportive but they don't necessarily know how. You have to keep in mind there's no manual for how to navigate this process. And although there are probably a ton of books that have been written now, many families won't take the time to find them and read them. Some will, some won't. And if you are a family member listening to this, understand that your person with addiction isn't the only problem in this equation. So often when I work with families and doing interventions, it's like everybody wants to point the fingers at the person with the addiction and act like they're the only one with issues. The truth is everyone has issues. And dealing with someone with addiction changes you. So as a family member, you have to have the awareness that you will need to have help. Addiction changes everyone even if you aren't the person with the addiction. And when you want your person to get help and turn their life upside down and change everything they do, remember that you need help to undo the damage also. Families have to learn and understand codependence and boundaries. They need guidance to process the hurt, anger, disappointment, confusion, And when your person gets help and starts to change, it doesn't serve them to do their own work and start growing up if you, as the family, aren't going to do the same thing. Your person getting clean and sober isn't going to fix everything. It's just opening a new chapter of feelings to understand and deal with. So let's talk about a few reasons your family and friends don't feel supportive. First of all, as a drinking person, you typically hang out with other drinking people. I know I did. All my friends were alcoholics because I didn't hang out with people who didn't drink the way I drank. And when I got sober, I didn't expect them to get sober. What I did was make it very clear I wasn't drinking and I wasn't going to partake in the drinking activities anymore. That was my boundary. I set my boundary. I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not doing the drinking things. Any one of my friends were welcome to do non-drinking things with me. I didn't break up with them or tell them I didn't want to hang out with them anymore. You have to understand that we build our lives with other people who have unhealthy relationships with substances, and we can't have expectations around their behaviors when we decide to make a change in our lives. We can have boundaries. We can ask them to respect that we're changing and to make some compromises to support your wellness. You have every right in the world to do that. But we don't have the right to expect them to get sober with us just to make it more comfortable for us, right? And this goes for family also. And there is a genetic component to addiction too, which means oftentimes some of our family members can have their own issues with alcohol, drugs, depression, anxiety, 
whether they think so or not, <laughs> they can have a lot of those issues. Or it could be behavioral. It could be disordered eating, gambling. It could be a million things. But there is a genetic piece to this. So oftentimes for families, they're just struggling with their own stuff. And it's not our responsibility to point out everyone else's problems. It's our responsibility to deal with our own problems. Don't get focused on what everyone else is doing or not doing to support you. Understand that everyone is allowed to be wherever they are in their own journey. No one has to be where you want them to be. So just remember your friends and family may have their own unhealthy relationships with substances and no one knows what to do. And this brings me to the first thing, communicate. If you don't communicate what you need, then no one knows how to support you. None of us has the ability to read minds. Your friends and family won't know how you feel, what you think, or what you need if you don't tell them. I see this so much. People are so scared to communicate, but then they get resentful and angry when people don't do what they want. (laughs) It's so unfair. And listen, and I've been in plenty of those relationships too. And I've been the person that doesn't communicate and then gets angry when nobody's reading my mind. I've been on both sides of it. It's horrible and it is terribly unfair. And I'm super grateful that I grew out of that and I learned how to communicate. I also understand 150% that communication is hard. I'm really good at it, and it's hard. There are also ways to get support with that. Hire a coach to help you walk through things and mediate. I do this a lot in my six-week program when my clients need to have conversations with their partners and they don't know what to say or how to say it, or the partner has a ton of questions and they don't know how to ask or if it's even okay to ask. I'll do a session with both people so everyone can be on the same page. This is also a great way to learn how to communicate better and understand your person better. So get support for these conversations. If you don't want to hire a coach or a therapist, then go on YouTube and find some videos where they're talking about what you want to talk about and have your person watch it with you. Super simple and totally free. But you have to help people to help you. They are just as overwhelmed and confused as you are. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. And the next thing I want you to remember too is family doesn't have to be blood related. We all have family members that we aren't that close to. Maybe you were closer when you were kids, but as you grow up and we become adults, we have different interests. Life takes us different directions. We move away. We grow apart. And you only see certain people at holidays. All of these factors can make this journey feel a little lonely, especially at family gatherings and holidays, but you can create a chosen family. You meet people along the way, you connect, you build these amazing relationships with people who get you and they may not be blood related, but they are the people who love you, know you and support you. So don't forget to lean on your chosen family that you've built and know that any of your friends who love you will support your decision. Even if it's difficult and they don't know exactly what to do, they will want to be by your side and support you being happier and healthier. Remember too that you are so much stronger than you think you are. We are some of the strongest people ever built. We are resilient and powerful, resourceful, brave. There is not a single piece of this that you can't get through. Even if your family isn't behind you or doesn't know how to support you for whatever reason. And maybe you have a family that wants you to be sober and they love that you're on that journey, but they don't quite know what to do or say. And it can feel awkward because you also don't know what to do or say. And if you're like most of my clients, you're probably a high-functioning, successful person in most areas of your life. But when it comes to this, you get overwhelmed and anxious and tongue-tied and you don't know what to say and you don't even know what yourself what you're feeling. So it's hard to try to articulate that to anyone else. But here's the thing. 
As the person who is getting clean and sober, we have help. If you go to 12-step meetings or any other program, you have a whole team of people to help navigate these situations. If you have a coach or a counselor or a therapist, they can help you navigate these conversations. But our families don't necessarily have a team. And oftentimes they won't seek one out. And that leaves a lot of the burden on us to figure it all out and to communicate it effectively and to be very patient with them. Your recovery is your responsibility. It's no one else's job to take the necessary actions to support your recovery. It's no one else's job to create your boundaries for you. This is your work to do. It's your recovery, so these are your conversations to have, and it's your responsibility to protect your sobriety. So communicate, right? We have three more things that you can do to build a strong, healthy recovery lifestyle, regardless of support, right? But first is communicate. The next thing I say is you have to be connected. Find a couple of key people you trust and follow their guidance. This is one of the problems I see when people try to do it, quote unquote, on their own. You don't have any good guidance or accountability. I couldn't use my broken thinking to fix my broken thinking. And you can't either. I had to find people that I trusted who had already achieved what I wanted to achieve, and I had to be willing to follow their suggestions. I did a whole episode about this too, about seeking out mentors of any sort, whether it's a sponsor in a 12-step program, a coach, a counselor, therapist, whatever. Find people who have created the type of life and the approach to life that you want. And I'll put a link in that in the show notes to that episode also if you want to go back and listen to it if you haven't already or listen again if you want to. For me, in the first few weeks of my sobriety, I was... I was able to pretty easily identify people in my meeting because I went to meetings every day. So I found people really fast that resonated with me. I liked their philosophies. I liked how they lived their lives. I liked that they showed up to meetings every single day, even with decades of sobriety. I liked the stability of their lives, that they were family-oriented and they were 100% dedicated to their recovery and mental wellness. And those were my favorite people, and that's what kept me coming back every day. They also were really funny, kind, and smart. So when I was figuring things out day by day, step by step, I had a few people to listen to and learn from. And I trusted their guidance because they had already done it successfully. Even when my ego wanted to kick in and tell me I didn't need to do those things, I don't need to do those things, I know how to take care of myself, I don't need someone telling me how to live, that's how I thought about sponsorship in the beginning because I was basically three I was so emotionally immature. And that's what I thought. I was like, I don't need somebody to tell me what to do. But my best thinking and my best decision making got me in a huge, drunken mess of a life. So I knew for sure my thinking couldn't be trusted. So when my ego would kick in with all my immature nonsense, I could remind myself that I had trustworthy, strong, and sober people to guide me. And I would follow their suggestions rather than listening to the noise and drama in my head. Because my best thinking got me drunk and almost dead, so that seems pretty clear that I didn't need to listen to my thinking. And this leads me to the next thing. (laughs) Do not trust the voice in your head. You've heard me talk about it. I call it the committee. You'll hear it called your inner voice or inner dialogue or a million other things. It's the chatter that goes on in your head 24-7. And in early recovery, that committee has a very different agenda than you have. And you can't listen to it. You need to be very clear that that voice is a pathological liar. 
You also hear about your subconscious mind. And to me, this is the real identity of your inner voice. The job of your subconscious mind is to keep you safe. And when you start changing your habits and doing things differently, that feels unsafe. So your subconscious will try its best to get you to stay the same because change feels dangerous. That's where it will talk you into things that aren't really the best things for you because it wants to be safe. And when you start rocking the boat and making huge changes and you feel uncomfortable, your anxiety goes sky high, worrying about every detail of your possible future, it feels like a major danger zone. You have to be clear that your head is going to lie to you. All of that, you're not really that bad. You can have just one. You can control it this time. You can get away with it. No one will find out. Or the flip side of it, your head tells you a drink will make you feel so much better. You're thinking it's the solution to coping with your feelings and disappointments. Or it tells you that a drink will make you fit in, or make you have more fun. And here's the truth of the situation. You're the one that has to be in charge. You're the one that has to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your head is lying. Because you're the one that has to fight it. No one can fight the internal battle for you. And you know better. When your head tells you you can have one or two drinks, you know better. This is also where having one or two trusted people can help. This is exactly the situation where you can reach out to your people to deal with those difficult moments of the chatter in your head trying to talk you into falling back into old behavior. One of the most difficult times will be when you are around people who are drinking and it feels like they aren't supportive of your recovery. And this leads me perfectly to the next point. Have boundaries around your time and energy, especially in the early months of your recovery. This is another thing that's your responsibility to set the boundaries to protect yourself. It isn't fair to expect other people to create boundaries for you by not having alcohol around you, right? It's not their responsibility. It's yours. Some people will naturally understand that it makes sense to not have alcohol around you, and some won't. Some people won't think about it at all, and some people will just be defiant and drink around you because they refuse to change their habits just because you are. This is when you have to remember that family and friends have their own situations and how they handle your recovery is about their own drama. It's not about yours. If there's a situation, an outing, a vacation, a gathering, and the presence of alcohol is going to make you uncomfortable or threaten your sobriety, then it's your responsibility to set boundaries to protect yourself. That doesn't necessarily mean you can't go to things. It means you have to decide what you're comfortable with and what you're not. Sometimes that does mean not going. Sometimes it means you have a boundary around your time. So you go, but you only stay an hour and take a safe person with you. And if it's an event that you know you will really struggle with, then don't go. Recognize what supports your new life and what supports your old life. Going to bars, going on the annual camping trip where everyone gets wasted all weekend, going to sports games with your drunk friends, all of these support your old life. Don't partake in activities that support your old life, then be surprised when you relapse. It's kind of silly when you think about it. You can't stay the same and expect to change. Again, if you think you still have to be a part of these activities, then set boundaries to protect yourself. Don't stay as long. Don't show up at 7 a.m. for tailgating when the game starts at noon. When you make a huge change in your life, it requires change. That means you have to change how you do things. When I decided to give up sugar, I stopped putting ice cream in my freezer. Imagine how you would look at me if you were at my house and I said, I don't want to eat sugar anymore. And then you walked in my kitchen and there were cookies and cakes and crap everywhere. Wouldn't you like scratch your head a bit and go, what the heck is she doing? 
It's the same with alcohol. If you want to have a new life, you have to fill it with new behaviors and activities. If you want to keep your same drunk friends, then reach out to them about going to breakfast or going for a walk or a hike or going to a yoga class. Invite them to do non-drinking things with you. Some will and some won't. When you are changing and growing, you have to look at what you do and who you do it with differently. Is this activity or person supporting my new life or my old life? Is this taking me a step closer to a drink or a step farther away from a drink? Period. That's how you look at everything. Is this a step further into my new life or is this a step back into my old life? That's how you look at everything. Let's recap these really quickly. One, communicate. No one can read your mind and it isn't fair to expect them to. If you don't communicate well, then start learning. Get help. Google it. YouTube it. Read about it. And practice. Don't sit on your ass doing nothing, then wonder why you feel crappy because you're keeping everything bottled up inside. Number two, get connected. Find a person or two that you respect and trust and follow their guidance. And as you grow and evolve, your people may need to change, but you have to have people you trust to learn from and people you are willing to take guidance from. Next, do not trust the voice in your head. You know better. If you're like 99% of the people with substance issues, you've tried to moderate it a thousand times and it doesn't work. You wouldn't be here with me right now if you could control your drinking. No matter what that inner voice says to you, remind yourself that you know better and that your best thinking got you into this mess. So reach out to one of your trusted people for solutions and truth. Lastly, boundaries around your time, your energy, your location, meaning choose carefully how you spend your time and energy, who you spend them on and where is this person, place, or situation getting me a step closer to my new life or a step farther away. If you want things to be different, do it differently. If you want your life to be different, then live it differently. If you want to change, then change. Don't do the same things with the same people in the same places, then wonder why you aren't changing. All right. I hope this has been super helpful. If you want to keep talking about this, join us in the Facebook group. We're always talking about episodes and celebrating victories and getting solutions to struggles and all those good things. There's always great conversation and support and love in that Facebook group. So join us there, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Addiction Unlimited. If you want to book a call with me about coaching, addictionunlimited.com forward slash call. Super simple. I will link that in the show notes as well. And I will also link the episode about mentors in the show notes too. So you can go back and listen to that one. If you want to, again, addictionunlimited.com forward slash call. If you want to book a call with me, everything will be in the show notes. So you can link directly from wherever you listen to podcasts. I hope you're having a fantastic day and I will see you next week. You've reached the end of another great episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast, candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.